Well, hello there. My name is Jan Burt, and this is my podcast, The Burt Not Ernie Show, where we talk about God's promises and the hope those promises bring to our everyday lives. Whenever I meet somebody new, I introduce myself as Jan Burt and say, like Burt and Ernie, since it's easy to confuse my last name with a different one. And almost always, people smile when they think of Burt and Ernie. That got me thinking. I'm a Burt, and I'm not an Ernie. But how often do we live as if we're someone God never meant for us to be? Part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. Hence the name, The Burt Not Ernie Show. I'm so glad you're here. Let's dig into God's promises. Well, hello again. Hey there. Hope you're doing well, growing in grace and knowledge and the love that the Lord has for you and that you are abundantly blessed as you seek to follow him. Today, we're tackling the final subject in the Hot Topic series, and you don't want to miss this one. We're taking a look at the promise of the soon return of our Lord Jesus. Let's get started. You're listening to the Burt Not Ernie Show podcast, part of the Spark Network, now playing in the Edify app. This is episode number 148. Well, uh, I guess I just couldn't end this Hot Topic series without getting into the hottest topic of them all. How close are we to the return of Jesus, the second coming? When? How soon? How long? You know, so of course, the very first verse that I'm going to share is from Matthew 24, verse 36, which says that no man, not even the angels, knows the hour or the day of Jesus's return. That's a true statement. It was spoken by Jesus himself. And I am not going to deny or argue with or even hint at anything other than the fact that that verse is completely true. Completely true. It is true, period, the end. Nobody knows the hour or the day. That's not a point that can be successfully argued against. Like, you know, this is the truth that Jesus gave us. There's no wiggle room. There's no getting around it. I have zero interest in falling into the camp of like, this is the day. This is the day. I know it's no, 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 no. I'm not going there. I will never go there. Okay. All right. Got that all cleared up. In this episode, hot topic, though it may be, I am not going to talk about dates or time specifically. It's unbiblical. So that goes right out the window. It has no place here because the word of God is the standard as it should be for any podcast that is talking about God's promises or the word of God. That's a no-brainer, right? The next verse that I want to look at is also from this same chapter, Matthew 24. We're going to look at verse 3. And in verse 3, we find the disciples asking Jesus this question. Tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Okay, I'm reading from the New Living Translation there. They are asking a very direct, super specific question. And we're going to take a look at exactly how Jesus answered this very direct, super specific question. They asked, he answered. It was super specific, their question, and his answer was as well. Since Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, we can expect that he is telling the truth here in Matthew 24. So that's our That's our bottom line, our common denominator. This is the truth according to the King of Kings, the one whose name is the truth, the one who will have faithful and true tattooed or written on his thigh when he returns. So we need to pay attention to his words. He is telling us the truth as he always does. Verses four through eight say this also from the NLT here. Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars. Some translations say rumors of wars. But don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Okay, so as we think about these four verses... What things can we identify as having begun to take place? Like they're already happening. Okay, note that this is not 
not uh, calling out dates and times and specifically saying this is the hour, this is the day. No, no, not trying to determine the specific moment of his return. This is paying attention to the signs of the times. Those are two very different things. We don't want to neglect being among those who are watching and expecting who, who are going to, you know, pay attention enough to have oil in our lamp and be ready when he returns. We don't want to neglect being among those people just because we're afraid that somehow that makes us the same as those who say on this exact day at this time he's returning. They're not the same. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's do what Jesus said to do. Pay attention. Be expectant for his return. Look at, you know, the signs of the times that tell us I'm right at the door, Okay. Pay attention. Know where you're at on the kingdom calendar, uh, because quite frankly, if we ignore that part of things, we don't have a heart for the lost. We don't have a desire to do the good works that the Lord predestined and planned for us to do, which include, of course, sharing about him with people who are hurting and who need the freedom, the hope, the healing, the blessing, and the eternal life that Jesus offers. So that's all that to say. That's kind of an aside, but Actually paying attention to where we are in the kingdom calendar and the signs of the times is not the same as saying he's coming on this day. Not the same at all. Many have come saying that they are the Messiah. We know this. Many are still doing that. That has been happening for quite some time. And keeping our eyes on Israel, we know that there is one rabbi there right now, and he's kind of being propped up. They're saying they think he's going to be possibly there Jewish long-awaited Messiah since they rejected Jesus, the actual Messiah. So yeah, we can put a check mark next to false messiahs coming to deceive. Check. How about this? Hearing about wars and rumors of wars or threats of wars. Big check mark next to that. You know, thank the Lord that he told us not to panic at the prospect of war because these things have to take place. I mean that. Does it ever just make you thankful? Like he said, don't panic. Don't get overwhelmed with fear and panic. These things have to happen. Very reassuring that Jesus said, do not panic, even when the scary thing that that maybe wants to make you panic is happening all around the world. Yeah, don't panic. So comforting. Okay. Um, He doesn't want us to be afraid, I guess, is what all of that means. And that's just such a gift from the Lord to know fear is not from him. So who's it from when we're fearful? It's not from him. 365 times the Bible says, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Fear not. Fear is not from him. It's not what he wants for his children. So where does fear come from? Always good to identify that. Okay. The point of prophecy is never to make us just like panicky, fearful. End times information that we find in the Bible. That's not the purpose. The Lord wants us anticipating, expecting, and excited about his return. Hopeful and sharing that hope with others. You know, any sense of urgency that we have is, it's really here in God's word to help us share with others, you know? Like, um, think about, think about, look at it this way. We wake ourselves up by being in the word of God and by believing it, by recognizing, oh, these things are happening. Okay, I need to pay attention. We're getting closer and closer every day to Jesus's return. Right. So it wakes us up. And then what do we do with being Woken up and not like modern culture woke, not woke woke culture. I mean, like actually woke in the only way that matters about Jesus. Well, hopefully we share that to wake others up. When the flood came, all of those who were outside of the ark, in other words, the ones who are not among Noah and his family, they all suffered. They all died. Is there anybody that you can encourage to get in the ark, so to speak? Maybe encourage them to give their life to Jesus. That's kind of, as Christians, our version of being in the ark, right? Christ followers were like in the ark in a way. Who knows that a right view of end times details, as Jesus gave them to us here in Matthew 24, that could be the wake-up call that somebody needs to bend the knee and receive eternal salvation. It really could be. So it shouldn't be the scariest thing in the world to talk about Jesus' his return, about Jesus' return. It should be hopeful for us. It also should make us kind of hyper aware that many, many people are not living in the hope that Jesus offers. These things must take place, said Jesus, but the end won't follow immediately. Okay, that's good to make note of. Those two things that we put a check mark beside, 
because we do see those things in the world today, false messiahs and wars and rumors of wars. They do not signify the end. More is to come. The Lord went on here to say, nation will war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Check, check. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. And yes, yeah, sadly, and I mean this, like sadly, there are famines. We have seen in my lifetime, I have seen so much news information about famines around the world. They're horrific. And it's more than really I could even possibly ever have imagined. It's heartbreaking. I hate it. People starving to death. I actually really do mean it when I say I just hate it. I wish we couldn't put a check mark next to that one. I wish the world were just not the way that it is, but check mark. Earthquakes, big check next to this one. If you were to look at like daily stats at earthquaketrack.com or earthquake.usgs.gov, you know, you can see in real time the dramatic increase in earthquakes. I'm talking about in diverse places all over the world. You know, you can pretty quickly determine that, oh, yeah, there have been 25 um, relatively large ones over the course of the last several hours. That's the stat as I'm recording this. Hawaii, the Dominican Republic, Texas, Russia, the Santa Cruz Islands, Myanmar, Ecuador, Fiji, Puerto Rico, China, Turkmenistan, New Zealand. That's just a few of them. Yep, put a check by this one. Earthquakes in diverse places. It's happening just as Jesus said it would. But all of this, he said in verse 8, is only the first of birth pains with more to come. If you're a woman who's given birth, you understand what this means. Birth pains, they get closer together, so they happen more frequently, they last longer, and they're more intense. This is the setup that Jesus gives for the end times before his return. The world we're in right now, we're meeting the criteria for moving on to the next level of birth pains, you might say. Verses 9 through 14. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. I really think we can honestly say that persecution of Christians, it has increased. And in many countries, being a Christian, it's punishable by death. A study of the history of Christian persecution shows that it is on the uptick. It's happening exactly as Jesus said it would. Bible prophecy is always proven true by history, and it always will be. Okay, as a side note, uh, in Israel, there was a recent proposal to enforce the punishment, or you could say persecution, of Christians who are sharing about Jesus with the Jewish populace. If you're sharing with someone who is um, of adult age, it's a one-year prison sentence, potentially, and a large fine. For for, uh, those who are under 18... Two years. Two years in prison. Okay, that that seems to fit what Jesus talked about here. Are Christians hated all over the world for following Jesus? Yeah, yes, they are. Have many turned away from the Lord and betrayed him and like hate one another? Yeah, absolutely. We have seen how the great falling away is happening. It just is. It's real. It's intense. And it's really hard to see it happen. False prophets are on the prowl to deceive many. Yep, check by that. Is sin rampant everywhere? Uh, Yeah, like 10,000 checks next to that one. Is the love of many growing cold? Got to be honest as I think about this one. Got to be totally honest. And once you get honest, you take a hard look at things around you. You'll say, yeah, the answer is yes. The love of many is growing cold. Are people more loving in your world, your sphere, your workplace, your neighborhood than they used to be or less? We can put a check there. And are people who follow Jesus more or less loving? Very often, sadly, the answer is less. The good news will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. Okay, we all know that this is more possible now and is happening at a far quicker rate than ever before since the time that Jesus spoke these words. 
just simply due to the time in which we live, the great increase in knowledge, which has led to the ability to share with such rapidity, even from a distance. We have technology that makes this like super possible. So we can't put a check next to this one really yet, since I don't believe every nation has heard, but we're getting there. You know, um, I remember at one point I, I had a conversation with somebody, this is quite a while ago, and they were saying they just wanted Jesus to come again soon. And I said, so are you giving toward missions that are like translating the Bible into the different languages of the world? Are you supporting missionaries who are going to the farthest reaches? You know, are you um, helping people who are using technology to reach the unreached? Because that sure seems like a way to put their money where their mouth was, you know, like, do you want the Lord to come sooner? Put some dollars toward the work that Jesus said needed to happen and do it joyfully. Okay, that's an aside, but just saying, just saying, it might be something that somebody needs to hear. There's important work that's not always funded very well. And I think it's a little bit like of an oxymoron to be like, I want Jesus to return, but I am not helping to fulfill what he said must happen. Ooh, yeah. So really, do you want him to return for selfish reasons? Or do you want him to return and have just like the biggest, most plentiful harvest of people to spend eternity with him as possible? Okay, now I'm going to read verses 15 to 28. And I'd love for you to just listen as I read. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than at any other time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders, so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. See, I have warned you about this ahead of time. So if someone says to you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here. Don't believe it. For as the sun, or, I'm sorry, verse 27, for as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby. So these signs indicate that the end is near. Okay, so... Will the temple be rebuilt then if there's going to be like the the sacrifice of, the, you know, the sacrilegious desecration? Well, it seems like it, I guess. I mean, right? That's That seems like it. Think about this, though. This will be a truly terrible, horrendous moment when the tables turn and the one who seemed like he was going to take care of world peace and the Jewish populace demands to be worshipped himself and sets up the object of desecration in the temple. The daily sacrifices will stop and the time of the end of tribulation will be in high gear, in full gear. And I do know that there was historically a time when there was someone who did set up an idol to himself in the temple and sacrificed a heifer, a cow. You know, we know that Jews and pigs, that's not, that's not acceptable in the temple. But, and, and that is, um, was mentioned in Daniel. And then, but there's also this, it seems to be from what I've read from much smarter old dead guys, much greater minds than mine seem to believe that's like there was one time that it already happened and that it's definitely going to happen again based on Daniel and based on Revelation. This will happen like again and it will be during the tribulation. So that's where I'm landing with that. I don't want anybody to think, hey, don't, do you not know about when this happened historically? I do know about that. But there, are, there seem to be two things going on here. Like this will happen again. How this works with the temple that is not rebuilt right now, I don't know. I don't know. I I don't have to know. What I have to know is in my own heart and mind, do I believe what the word of God has to say? And am I watching and paying attention to the signs of the time so that I can work effectively for his kingdom, keep oil in my lamp and be, I'm telling you, that parable of 
of the 10, you know, bridesmaids, I want to be one who has my lamp full who's like, man, I'm ready. I'm waiting. I'm watching at any moment. I'm ready. That's a good way to live as a Christ follower. If we're living any other way, we need to really, 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 really turn that thing around. I know I'm being super blunt, but don't play games with this. The Lord has an expectation that we would live well for him. So let's actually do that. Let's be his people who live well for him. All right, um, back to talking about this, these last verses all the way through verse 28 in Matthew 24. So uh, we know that during this period when the tribulation is going to happen, that Jesus is referring to the end times when he says, there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. So obviously, this isn't what happened in the past, right? Because it's, it's still coming in the future. Unless that time of the calamity is shortened, not a single person would survive. All right, we have not been to that point yet. These are going to be very dark days. Now, I'm not going to hit on the rapture in this episode, but I will say this. I think the church should be ready to endure hard times, to endure to the end, whatever that end may be, to be committed to Jesus because he is so worth it. The rapture should not be like my ticket out of here. I'm punching out. Bye, suckers. No, it should be considered a glorious event. And as long as we're still here as his bride, as his church that bears his name, let's be willing to suffer for his sake. I really do mean that. False messiahs and false prophets are going to rise up. They're going to perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, even if possible, God's chosen ones. Okay, so if you read Revelation, you can read about false prophets doing the miraculous, leading to great deception. It's, it's written there. And in the Bible, when it uses the words God's chosen ones, it usually, if not always, and I really think it's probably always, it's talking about Israel, his chosen ones, his chosen nation, his chosen possession. Gentile believers, we are grafted in. So when you think about the church, we're part of the bride of Christ. When you think about Israel, that's his chosen possession. The verbiage is usually a little different, talking about the church and talking about Israel. On that day, when the Lord returns, every eye is going to see him. He is going to come the same way that lightning flashes across the sky. This is not going to be a hidden event. It's not going to happen in secret. So anybody who says it's already happened and you just don't know about it, that's not the truth. Jesus said it won't be hidden, so it won't be. As the gathering of vultures shows there's a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. I'm going to say that again. As the gathering of vultures shows that a carcass is nearby, so these signs indicate the end is near. It is safe to say that the end is near. It's biblical even to say that the end is near. We need to know the signs of the time so we can do the work with some urgency. We need a sense of urgency about sharing about Jesus with people, about praying big, bold, daring prayers for people, for their souls, for deliverance from the things that are just strangling and choking the life out of them. People matter. They matter to Jesus, and so they ought to matter to those of us who follow Jesus. Without a sense of urgency, we just, we get in a drift. We go through life and we aren't praying. We're not seeking the lost. We're not sharing anything about the Lord, anything that really will make a lasting and eternal difference in people's lives. We're not sharing about that in our, in our conversations, in our text messages, on social media. Uh, you, you know what I'm saying, right? It's, it's just not that urgent, you know, not that urgent. And for Americans, at least... If it's not urgent, it's not getting done. Let this be your reminder to apply some urgency to your praying. I mean, pray for the lost and get urgent about it. Plead with the Lord for them. Seek out his will for you and for others. Intercede on behalf of those who have needs are all around you. Invite that person to church or to your Bible study or small group. Who has God put on your heart? What has he put on your heart to do in regard to that person or maybe several people? Will you do it now? Please? Please? All right, I'm going to finish this episode by reading verses 29 through 51. But first, I want to mention that I have an upcoming online event, and I want to invite you to be part of it. It's the Summer 2023 
online prayer retreat. It's going to be seven video sessions on prayer that also could be audio because you can always, isn't that the beauty of things like whether it's like think of YouTube, you can listen to it or you can watch it. So video slash audio going to be looking at what the Bible says about prayer. And then we're going to actually spend time praying. There'll be content that you can download using your own prayer time and some bonuses. And I am following the Lord's leading. The Lord has led me to make everything that I have to offer super affordable, super accessible, even to the point of being like you could say like dirt cheap. So God said, do this, Jan, and I'm just obeying. So it's $7, like, yep, like a cup of coffee, seven bucks, and you can access all the content forever. I'm going to say that like a... You know, the movie quote, forever. Okay, so if you're interested, you know, I'll throw up a link. You can reach out to me. The event won't be happening until later this summer. I've got a lot of stuff coming up first, and it's going to be going live. I'm thinking probably the third week in July, but you can get signed up anytime between now and then, and I'll mention it again in the coming weeks. And thanks in advance to everyone who's interested. I'm praying it's going to be a blessing Look, prayer changes lives, and I am a firm believer that one of those lives may as well be yours. Time spent in prayer is never time wasted, so I'm excited about this. And, you know, the lives of those for whom you pray, why not Why not um, have some set-aside, carved-out time to really grow in prayer and to pray over those people that the Lord has put on your heart? It's, it's just like that's going to be lasting lasting use of your time. So I really hope that you will consider joining me for the summer 2023 prayer retreat. I would say, pray about it. Lord, do you want me to be part of this? And then whatever he says, go with that. Okay, here's the rest of the chapter now, Matthew 24. Immediately after those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks, my master won't be back for a while, and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk? The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, that, that's, uh, there's a lot there that you can chew on and think about. And I'm posting all of this in the show notes so you can scroll down toward the bottom and read those verses and pray over them for yourself. This has been a heavy episode, but it's so important. There's great promise for us, the promise and the return of Jesus. He is coming back. Let's live like we really believe he is coming back and soon. Let's be about our Father's work in this current day and age because that's all we've got, my friends, is right now. 
You're not promised tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. Let's be about his work right now in this current moment. And let's not forget that he is indeed coming very, very soon. I want us to all live well while bearing all these things, all these words of Jesus from Matthew 24, while we bear these things in mind. Alrighty, Lord bless you. I'll see you next time. And don't forget, God's promises are true for you today. All right, bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this episode that is part of the Spark Media Network that can now be heard on the Edify app. I'm so glad you joined me for this episode of the Burt Not Ernie Show. It's an honor and a blessing to talk about God's promises with you. Have a fabulous day, and remember, part of knowing who you are is knowing who you're not. Lord bless. I'll see you next time.